All right, welcome back. Hope you all had a great week so far. Today we're continuing our RBT exam practice question series where we go through the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. If you're looking for our proven study materials, please check out btexamreview.com. We offer three practice exams, a task list study guide, and of course, our famous combo pack. We also have a YouTube membership now if you would like to support us further. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. Other than that, let's work hard, study hard, get to our questions. Question one. Tonight you're making a Panda Express recipe you found on the internet. The recipe instructs you to heat your pan on the highest heat you have and then put in cooking oil. However, you notice you start burning your steak, so you reduce the heat, which stops the burning. Reducing the heat is the what relative to burning the steak. All right, we are starting off with a behavior question. This is an antecedent behavior consequence question. And the thing we need to do whenever we deal with the reinforcement, punishment, or an ABC question is identify what behavior we're looking at and in relation to what, right? Because that in relation to or relative is very important when identifying the answer, right? Because when we talk about reducing the heat, well, reducing the heat takes place in this bigger scenario of behavior. When it says relative to burning the steak, that helps us kind of narrow it down and really start to identify our ABC contingency. So if we have reducing the heat, what is the antecedent to reducing the heat? Well, you, you start burning your steak. So what happens? You reduce the heat. And the consequence for you reducing the heat is stopping the burning. So that's negative, most likely, reinforcement. So you have to ask yourself, is reducing the heat an antecedent? Is it a response? Is it a consequence? What are we dealing with here? Is it an A, a motivating operation? Well, we know it's not a motivating operation, right? Because it has. we have our antecedent. We start burning our steak relative to burning the steak. It ha it's happening after we start burning our steak. So it's in response to burning the steak. Is it a B, a behavior? It is, right? If our antecedent is burning the steak, our behavior is reducing the heat, then our consequence is stopping the burning, which is our negative reinforcer. We don't have any positive consequence here. We're removing the burning, right? So if we look if we look relative to burning the steak, reducing the heat is going to be the behavior. Relative to burning the steak makes burning the steak the antecedent, stopping the burning the consequence. Again, it's so important in behavior questions to identify your antecedents, your behaviors, and your consequences, and also identify where is it taking place in the question, right? What In what context are you looking at reducing the heat? It's very important when answering these very applied behavior questions. Reinforcement should always be our first instinct when teaching skills and changing behavior. Which of the following is a potential problem with using punishment? Remember, reinforcement is always our first reaction. It's our first go-to. When BCBAs create plans, we always start with reinforcement. There are a lot of ethical issues with punishment. There are a lot of problems with punishment. This question is asking you, the RBT, to identify a potential problem with using punishment, meaning probably one of these at least is going to be a potential problem, right? And it has to be, okay? Because that's what the question is looking for. So, A, punishment is only effective for children under 12 years of age. Well, we know age only says so much, especially for some of the populations we work with. Age really isn't an indicator of all that much, right? Saying that a procedure like punishment would work for children under 12 years of age is just only children under 12 years of age is just false, right? B, punishment is not permanent. If the punishment stops, the behavior will come back. This is a problem. Punishment is not permanent. And why is punishment not permanent? Because punishment doesn't teach a replacement behavior. That's why punishment is always used in conjunction with something else. If we're punishing a behavior and we never teach a different behavior, if the punishment ever stops, that behavior is very likely to come back. C, punishment is cannot be used to reduce dangerous and harmful behavior. That's just not true, right? Punishment can absolutely be used to reduce dangerous and harmful behavior. And then D, clients must be able to verbally communicate for punishment to be effective. Again, not true. You have to think about, again, most of the populations we work with, sometimes we deal with nonverbal clients and punishment is effective on them like it is anyone else. The problem with punishment 
here is it's not permanent. If punishment stops, the behavior will come back. It's not true that it's only effective for children. It's, n it's not true that it can't be used to reduce dangerous and harmful behavior. And it isn't true that the client has to verbally communicate. What is true is it's not permanent. So our answer here is going to be B. After a brief discussion with your client's parents, your BCBA decides they want to teach the client how to change their bed sheets. They ask you to conduct a task analysis for practice. How might you go about doing that? This is a harder question, I'd say, maybe for an RBT, especially if you're just starting to study. What is your BCBA asking you to do? They want you to conduct a task analysis. And the question wants to know, well, how are you going to do that? So you have to remember, what's the difference between a task analysis and a task chain? Well, the task analysis breaks down the behavior, creates the task chain, and then we use task chaining to teach. So if your BCBA wants you to conduct a task analysis on changing bed sheets, what are you going to be doing? Well, you're going to be breaking down the behavior of changing bed sheets into steps. How are you going to do that? A, you would want to decide whether to use a forward chain or a backwards chain. You're getting ahead of yourself if you choose A. We have yet to identify even our task chain. We haven't identified any steps yet. Without that task chain, and without doing the task analysis, we can't just decide to use forward chaining or backwards chaining. So A is getting ahead of yourself. B, you could change your own bed sheets and record the steps. Is this a decent way to identify steps of changing bed sheets? Sure. Assuming you're capable of changing your bed sheets, you can observe yourself changing bed sheets and write down the steps. It's a good way to break it down. C, you would ask the client to change your bed sheets and record the steps. What's wrong with C? Well, the problem with C is you're asking the client to do the behavior that we want to teach them. So are they going to pull it off successfully? Probably not. How much help is that really going to be in identifying steps of changing bed sheets? So A is getting ahead of ourselves. C is unrealistic. B is going to be the most useful. You change your own bed sheets and record the steps you took to get there. So if you want to conduct a task analysis for practice, how might you go about doing that? Well, B, you can change your own bed sheets and record the steps. Obviously, it's not D, not none of the above. Which of the following answer choices does not represent discrimination training? Discrimination is very easy. It's a very easy concept. Discrimination is simply choosing or identifying between two things. Okay, When we discrimination train, we teach clients and learners to be able to choose between two or more stimuli. Simple as that, right? It's often confused with differentiation. And differentiation, unlike discrimination, deals with responses. And that's a very important distinction. Discrimination deals with choosing between stimuli. Differentiation deals with choosing between responses. So in this case, we're looking for an answer choice that does not represent discrimination. A, a baseball player needs to toss the ball underhanded instead of throwing it regularly. You need to ask yourself, is the baseball player trying to choose between stimuli or responses? Well, the baseball player is trying to choose between responses, right? The response of underhanded throwing instead of throwing it regularly. Okay, He's still tossing the same stimulus, the ball. He's just differentiating his responses. So A does not represent discrimination training. If we think A is our answer, do we pick it and move on? We do not. We read all of our answer choices every single time. B, a man with autism needs to select his lunch from the fridge and not his coworkers. So in this case, the response is what? Selecting lunch. And the man has to be able to discriminate between lunches. C, you ask your son to grab you a Mountain Dew out of the ice chest with all the drinks. What is the response? Grabbing you a drink. He has to discriminate between Mountain Dew and drinks. So you see how this is going, right? In the first question, the stimulus is the ball. The responses. So there's two or more responses in A. B and C, we're discriminating between two or more stimuli. And then D, a poker player needs to tell the difference between the ace of hearts and the ace of diamonds. So what are we doing? Discriminating between the ace of hearts and the ace of diamonds. So which of the following answer choices does not represent discrimination training? It's going to be A, the baseball player needs to toss the ball underhanded 
instead of throwing it regularly. Here we're talking about differentiation. If you know your client is prone to prompt dependence, what would likely be the last type of prompt you might try and use? Okay, we have a term, prompt dependence. Let's think about our term, prompt dependence. What does prompt dependence mean? It means your client or your learner is now reliant on a prompt in order to engage in a response. They have to have that prompt. They wait for the prompt before they're engaged in the desired response. Prompt dependence is not something you want. It's something you want to break as soon as possible. Prompt dependence is it's annoying. It's hard to deal with. So if you know your client is prone to prompt dependence, you want to avoid it. And how are you going to likely avoid it? Well, you're going to have to choose wisely what type of prompts you might use. And when dealing with prompt dependence, you need to remember the more intrusive the prompt, the more likely prompt dependence is to occur. So we need to look for the, if we're looking for the last type of prompt we might try and use, we're going to try to identify the most intrusive prompt here. A, a movement prompt. A movement prompt is basically a gestural prompt, right? Pointing at something, touching something. Not that intrusive, right? It's not overly intrusive. B, graduated guidance. Graduated guidance is a type of physical prompting. Physical prompting is the most intrusive prompting we can have. So really, the only thing more intrusive than graduated guidance is going to be some sort of full physical prompt. If full physical is not an answer, most likely our answer is going to be B. C, a positional prompt. Positional prompts are very unintrusive. You're just simply moving the stimuli around. And then D, a verbal prompt is arguably the least intrusive prompt there is. You're just using your voice to picture card or something of that nature to verbally prompt the person, right? So if we want to reduce prompt dependence or, or uh, prevent prompt dependence, we need to choose the, the prompts that are least intrusive. So the last type of prompt we're going to we're going to want to use are is graduated guidance, right? Which is physical, which is the most intrusive. Lane is ready to implement the new token system that his BCBA just designed. The behavior plan is targeting sitting in the chair with two feet on the ground. Every three to five minutes, Lane praises the client for sitting in the chair with two feet on the ground and hands them a Toy Story token. What type of reinforcement schedule is Lane most likely using? Don't overthink this one. It's long. There's a lot happening. But we're going to focus in on what the question is asking. And the question is asking us about the type of reinforcement schedule that Lane is using. Forget everything else, and let's look at our reinforcement schedule. It says, every three to five minutes, Lane praises the client for sitting in the chair with two feet on the ground and hands them a Toy Story token. So our reinforcement schedule looks like every three to five minutes. So if we think about basic reinforcement schedules. Is this going to be fixed or variable? going to be variable, right? Because we're working on an average. A fixed schedule is a set amount. A variable schedule is an average. So we need a variable schedule here. Then you ask yourself, is this a ratio schedule or an interval schedule? A ratio has to do with responses. Interval has to do with time. Here we have time. So we know we have a variable interval schedule. So A, fixed ratio 6, is not going to apply. B, variable interval 4, definitely could apply. C, variable interval seven, maybe it's still a variable interval, right? D, fixed interval three is not going to apply. The only two that could be possible answers are B and C. So you have to ask yourself, if we're working in an average, three to five minutes, is that going to be an average of seven minutes or four? Well, that's going to work out to an average of typically four minutes. So what type of reinforcement schedule is Lane most likely using? Well, we have a variable schedule based on intervals and an average of four minutes. Your best friend and, and you both get jobs at the ABA agency down the street from your apartment. You both have experience as RBTs. During your second training session, the BCBA corrects the way you are running DTT. How should you respond? This is an ethical question having to do with how RBTs respond to feedback. In this case, you're brand new at this agency. You have experience as an RBT. So you might've been trained differently in the past. But in this case, your BCBA says, I want you to run it differently. They're giving you feedback. How do you respond? A, explain to the BCBA that is how you run DTT. That's fine, except that's not really what the BCBA is asking. The BCBA is saying, here, I would like you to run DTT this way. Now, if you disagree, you can ask questions, right? But typically, you're supposed to take that feedback and go with it, okay? It isn't saying you 
always have to be compliant 100% of the time with no input. That's not true, right? But instead of explaining, well, this is how you do it, you need to start asking questions. So B, accept the feedback and ask for clarification if necessary is much more appropriate. You're taking the feedback in, but you're also getting clarification. Well, why do you do it this way? So you take the feedback and continue implementing DTT how you were previously taught. No, that's not taking the feedback, right? That's ignoring the feedback. And then D, report your BCBA to the administration. Obviously not. What you want to do here is take your feedback and then ask for clarification if necessary. That should always be an option. Questioning what you're told, getting a reasonable answer. Why? Once you get the reasonable answer, move from there. So how are you going to respond? You're going to accept the feedback and ask for clarification if necessary. RBTs take feedback and implement feedback. How often do RBTs need to get their supervision forms filled out and signed? Kind of a fluency question, right? Just a rote question is something you need to know. Obviously, RBTs must be supervised. You have to fill out supervision forms and you have to get them signed, which you need to do. How often do you need to do that? Weekly, monthly, every six months, or yearly? Well, you need to do them monthly. You have a required amount of supervision you need per month as an RBT. Each month, you have to get these filled out and signed by your supervisor. Just in case the board ever audits you, you have proof that, yes, you are receiving your supervision. Not something you can apply here, not something you can figure out. It's just one of those things you need to know. So how often do you need to get your supervision forms filled out and signed? Well, B, monthly. Fantastic. Thank you for watching. Please check out btexamreview.com for our famous combo pack, our three practice exams, and our study guide. Like, subscribe. When you let us when you pass, please let us know so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. Other than that, work hard, study hard. See you soon.